Thank you for being here, Mr. Abdullah. Today's interview will mainly focus on employment. What is the definition of employment? Pleasure for having me, um, Mr. Bashir, first. Um, the definition of employment, it falls in, it's very broad and, and um, people don't understand. Mainly. When you hear employment, people go, Job, jobs, I want to get jobs, blah, blah, blah. But employment itself is very broad. It falls in three big categories. Uh, number one being, um, first, you have to have history. When I say history, I mean such as work, jobs that you have done. History can be employment history, can be three things mainly. One being volunteer, unpaid worker, two being internship, where sometimes it's a paid entrance, sometimes it's you either work going toward credit, trying to get credits for the internship, and doing that to fulfill your degree requirement or your certificate requirement, whichever it might be. Third is actual job, where you got paid, where you went to work, you were expected to show up to work, you had a boss, you mainly work, work. That's the third thing. All those three things are in one category only, and that's called employment history. The next one is education. Education mainly it doesn't have to be just college degree. It doesn't have to be trade that you have done. Education means schools that you have attended from young age. You have to list at least one school. Even if you didn't graduate high school, list at least the school name, but don't give yourself the credit of earning the high school diploma because you haven't earned yet. Remember that. You have to own the high school diploma or you have to own the degree in order to claim. So what you do is basically you list the school name there. You list the date you attended and so on and so on. But you could not claim that you earned your high school diploma nor your degree. List, you, have, you must list as education. That's the number two. Number three, skills. The skills, qualification, highlights, objective, they all fall into one card. It's all the same. The same meaning, it is basically kind of trading in, saying the skills, even highlights, will still be the same. But the skills and highlights, skills basically comes from, is created between education and employment history. That's where skills is created. The skills doesn't just come. If the skills is from between those two. The skills will be mainly things that you know, things that you're expert on it, such as word process, Microsoft Office word process, Excel, PowerPoint, Access, those things, things that you kind of are familiar with, it, those are called the skills. An example will be from job skills. Let's say, I'm going to use aerospace manufacturing. Machinists, those individuals who have to make the plane, create the parts, and all those stuff, they have codes, accident codes, all two. So there's all these codes involved. CNC machining, CNC that, you know, so blueprint. So things like that, that you learn at the job, those are skills that you develop from work. So what, what basically happens is what you have learned from work and what you have learned at school while you were in school, you put them together, things that you know, that's the skills, if it fails the skills part. So those three categories, employment, education, skills. Mm -hmm. That's the broad definition of employment. That's the full employment. When you say employment, what is it? It's jobs, that's right. But then it breaks down. When you're applying jobs, then it falls into 
resume, it falls into cover letter, sending, and you know, getting interviewed. So it's a whole process. There's so-called definition, and there's so-called the whole explanation of explaining the whole employment process. So when you go and you start talking about resume, cover letter, that's the process. And the definition is basically those three cardigans that I just break it down for you. What is the American dream? American dream is basically having the life that you want from your childhood. When I say the life that you want from your childhood, it's basically nice car, nice job, nice beautiful family, two kids, you know, normal American middle income, not leaving paycheck to paycheck. Basically, both you and your spouse working, good jobs, making over 50K, each making over 50k and living comfortably having your own house the dream your dream job your dream car so everything that you dreamed as a childhood having that like having that in front of you living that dream that's the American dream living in that dream as your childhood what you dreamed when you were going to school whatever you want to accomplish example you were studying doctor or to become a lawyer. But you have that dream, you have that vision, you have that visual picture that you draw in somewhere in your room board saying, okay, when I grow up, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to be. This is how I'm going to walk there. You know, so all those brought to you in reality, like you're living in the real world. Now, this is the American dream. Does it does it ex exist anymore? What we are facing now, 2013, mm -hmm. is the American dream and American reality. That's what we are facing. The American dream doesn't really exist anymore. Because now we are facing the American reality. So, I would change that definition, the American dream, to the American reality. Like what we live in, what we face in now. Crisis. And that crisis basically meaning such as everything you dreamed about as a childhood, before it was easy, you dreamed of going to college after high school, working, part time while you're going to college, only your degree, and after you graduate finding employment, getting married, buying a nice car, buying a house, two kids, living comfortable. But now thirty five percent of college graduates are jobless. They don't have jobs, are unemployed. 35%, that's the biggest number that you can say. So, when someone comes out of college, the American dream would be supposed to be easily followed direction, but it's not happening. Students graduate from college, they have their degree, they can't find the employment. And that's the reality. There's, there's nothing that they can do. But then the American dream says, you work hard, you get it, see? So that definition is not fulfilling. They worked hard to earn that degree. They woke up four years and every morning, every day to go to school. They worked hard, test after test, papers after paper. College is not easy. But when you come out, all that hard working, all those dreams, you can't find the job you want. The American dream, matter of fact, it changed to the bartender dream. 
I say that because many students come out of college, they work at a bar, McDonald's, do all these other jobs. Where's their million dream? It's not that they're lazy. It's that they sent hundreds, thousands of resumes, cover letters, no response. You get one response and an interview when you are competing with hundreds of people, when you're competing with many people, that interview. The American dream was destroyed in this recession. Before the recession, 2008, what was happening was everybody had their job. Everybody was comfortable. They had their job. People were just retiring. So the way the system worked is basically if we say everybody to give a job, we wouldn't have that many jobs. What we, the system, the way it's working is the system retires some people. They retire. Some people retire and young generation come in. Retire young generation. People die, newborn babies. So that's, that's the way the system was working. But when the recession came, what happened was it hit the system in the middle. It's like taking the middle people out. I say them, I call the middle people like 30 to 50. Those people, not even 50, 40, actually 40 to 25, that middle people. So it hit the middle people. When you don't have middle people, the middle people are the ones who produce the babies. They are the mother and fathers that produce the babies. But when you take this out, you're no longer producing babies. I say that because you're no longer producing jobs. There's no jobs. You can't produce jobs because you took this out. There's no jobs that you could produce. The other people, they are already finished having kids. Like, you know, after you reach certain age as a woman, you don't continue having kids. So they are at the tip. The younger is they are going through puberty. I am giving this example through this because puberty basically I'm saying they're going through college, they're going through all this stuff, they're younger. So they can't just have babies. They're going through college. I bought this baby coat so you can kind of understand, break it down. When the recession came, many middle people lost their jobs. Middle people will have either 30, 35, 40, 25, 28, around them. They have their college degree already. They were in, the, in their career working already. They had in high schools already. They will already live the American dream. The recession hit it before and after them. Then when the recession hits, they have 10 years or five years or eight years of experience knowing doing the job. They have the degree, they know everything. So they were laid off, laid off. And now, when the middle people are laid off, no jobs, it's hard for somebody who who's graduated from college to get a job because there's no jobs. The people who are supposed to be retiring as the system is supposed to be working they're holding into their job like that. They don't want to let it go because they're scared of this recession. What are they going to face? So that, that's what they're scared of it. What are they going to face? So they are holding to their lower jobs, no? They're not letting the jobs out. College graduates, they can't go nowhere. They don't have the jobs. The jobs are not there. When the job market started picking up, now, as in while the job market is picking up, the reason that it's hard to find a job right after college is because those middle people, they have the same degree as you do. On top of that, they beat you on the experience. So they have the degree. You don't have 10 years of experience. You just got out of college. You're 20 something. You're not gonna have ten years of experience. You're not gonna have any. You don't wanna have any years of experience. 
those people were really sitting on their couch waiting any little opportunity to come by, the middle people. So when the job is posted, somebody's coming out with masters, bachelors, 10 years, seven years, eight years experience, and you get out of college with bachelors, who is this employer gonna hire? Somebody who already know how to do the job, somebody who knows how to do the job in academically, in experiencely, in skills, or somebody who only knows how to, how to do the job academically and partial of the skills. Because poor, I say partial skills, you haven't went through the employment part yet because you only got your skills from education. The full skills is experience, work experience, and education. So you don't have or the work experience part. So that only gives you partial of your skills. And when you have partial skills, and this person has fully loaded skills, fully loaded degree, fully loaded experience, and you both apply the same job, you have no chance uh, of getting into that door. There's no chance. That employer must be crazy in order to take you, than to take somebody who's with 10 years experience, degree, fully skilled knowledge. Then the employers started going by like, before the recession. Employers used to go to colleges to recruit. You were getting recruited to a job before you even apply. You before that's how it was before the recession. So employers will come to the college campuses and recruit students, hey after you graduate, can you work like you know it was like picking. Microsoft were picking people, Boeing were picking people. Google, picking Yahoo, all these big Apple, but now there's so many people with experience, with food with loaded, that are looking for jobs. They don't have to recruit, they don't have to waste their gas to go up their college, they don't have to do that. They're getting in their house, they're getting people, so they don't have to do that. There's no need for it, but there are only one job, 100 of people are applying with experience, with degree, and you just got out of college, that's luck. That's, the, that's how the American dream may fall and they die. As a career navigator, what advice would you give those college graduate about to enter the workforce? What I would really tell them is to network. Network is the bigger thing right now because there's no more thing that to believe in their head just because you have a college degree you're going to get a job you know you are the same as the one who does not have a college degree you same. if you have a college degree do not brag about it college degree means nothing nothing zero i say that because you can apply so many jobs and not get one response. So many jobs. Earlier, as I referenced back, my reference back as the middle people. The middle people are taking that. Your jobs. So what you want to do is develop networking. Set, set up LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a professional working basically where you get employers and you know you get responders. So kind of go to chambers meeting, chambers conference meeting, conference meeting. If go to events, develop that networking. Networking is the major thing. When a job is good, only now. 20% of the jobs are getting posted. 80% is in-house. 80% of the jobs is in-house, the job market. 20%. And there are so big number of people looking for a job, but only 20% are getting posted. 80% is networking. Like, I know you, you know my friend, you know my cousin, you know so-and-so, so you give so-and-so the job networking like like you come to me 
if I had a job and you tell me, hey, my brother is unemployed, he's looking for a job, he has his degree, he graduated from so -so school, can you help him? And I'm the boss, I'm the CEO or whatever I am, my title is at the moment. If I have the ability and the power to hire, I will hire your brother because you and I had a strong relationship. I think your brother will do good at my company because I know you. So I'm thinking, I'm assuming your brother is like you, rather than hiring a stranger and basically trusting them that they're gonna show up to work the next day. So, so see, that's where employers are like, uh, network, 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 more and more. Don't go ahead, don't just sit at your couch and apply job, apply job, job tips. You have sleep chance, sleep, sleep chance. If you're doing that, you're just applying jobs and you're not networking and you're a college graduate student, again, I'm going to say you are the same as the person who has no degree, never attended school. Sam, Sam, that person who has never attended school, has no degree, can apply those jobs too and not get a call. You neither don't get a call. Networking. What do you think those who are passionate about either music or about their business, about their own business? I mean, that's, that's a great question. When you're passionate about something, that's your belief. And don't let anyone ever tell you you can't do something. Don't let ever. And let anyone tell you you can't do something because it's very, very wrong. And I say that because when somebody tells you you can't do something, that's when you kind of energize. Like, you wanna disbelieve them, you wanna show them that you could do. But at the same time, you have to face the reality what is happening at the moment. Many people are tickled down because of confused of reality and dreams. Dreams and reality. They're confused, many people. When you're passionate about music, that's what you want to do, the music. But we have to face the truth. That we, we, you have to have a common sense mind. If you don't Many, many, many Americans, they, they are out of lack of the common sense mind. The common sense is mind, basically, saying, look at the world, look at America. How many million people, how many million people live here in the U.S.? A huge number. Look, musicians are not even one million. Superstars, I'm talking about, not even one million. I don't think they can even reach a hundred thousand. And we're talking about millions, maybe like 200 professional, professional music, or 150, or maybe 100, maybe 50. What is your chance of being one of those? I know that's the, your passion, but what is your sleep chance of being one of those? If there are so many underground rappers, there are so many underground musicians, there are so many, so everybody's trying, everybody's competing, everybody wants to be that TV star. But when you, while you're competing, you letting your life pass by. Because life is passing by fast. You letting your life just slip, slip pass by. You, you busy on making music, trying to make music, trying to get yourself out. But when your chance is like, you play the lottery in the hole you said, there's only one power ball, ticket. If you keep on buying these tickets, even if you spend $100, if your state is not winning, the whole, another state was, what is your chance? 
So you have to kind of question, you have to face the reality. What is your chance? You have to have something else. You cannot have just music, music, music. You could not do that. At least some of your relatives are superstar. Your relative are superstar. And owning it by your own business. You can own your own business in many ways. But again, don't mix yourself in between dream and reliable. Don't mix yourself. Because musicians, like these younger kids, want to be gangster, trying to rap, trying to make up their way, blah, blah, blah. not going to school, writing down lyrics, you know, kind of working all this stuff, making themselves busy, doing all this stuff. They're letting their life pass by. They realize, they realize that they still have nowhere at the age of 30, nowhere. And they just let it pass by their life when they could have went to school, college, they could have developed work experience, they could have done many other things. Now they're 35. They know music is nowhere. Nothing to do. This sends them back to the warehouse. You have to load and unload. Eight hours. 75 pounds. You have to lift them all the time. The rest of your life. The rest of your life. The music career is a hundred percent. Not even one percent that that chance is coming true, and you have to you have to know that you have to know that you have the common sense. So you have to use the common sense. And only in your business, you could, but don't mix dream versus rely. Don't mix that. If you mix that, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail like the musicians. Those who want to be musicians, actually, that's how you're gonna fail. What advice would you give those who are coming from high school? Those who are coming from high school. And my advice would be, my reference back again, American Dreams topic, and also American Reliant topic. I say that because be real. I mean, I say be real, like know what you want to do. Like know specifically point targeted, like this is how I'm going to do it. This is what I'm going to do. This is. So you know what it takes. Know what it takes to be there. Because I'm a career navigator. And I also do academic counseling, and I counsel many students. And I can tell you, at the academia, we are not doing great in counseling. This younger, they just come out of high school. They don't know what is. They don't know what they're facing. But all they see is these TV shows. Maybe their parents. Maybe. Some of them, their parents may never have to attend their school. And those, even if those who parents were successful, are not gonna make it good. There's still the understanding. You still have to understand. And just because somebody that you know made it through, that doesn't mean you're going to make it through too. Just because your dad is a lawyer, that doesn't mean that you will be a lawyer too. Or just because your dad is a doctor, that doesn't mean you're gonna be a doctor too. Know the process. If your dad became a lawyer, 1980, 1980 laws was different than 2013. Son, you gotta know that. If your dad became a doctor, 1970, 1980 something, and you gotta know that. Whatever the requirement then to be a doctor is not the same as 2013. Things are getting harder and harder and harder. So you have to know that. Let's say you come out of high school. 
you are the college, the community, community college or university, and you say, you want to be a doctor, you want to make a lot of money. Okay, but at high school you never was good at math, you never was good at science or biology. You just never was, and you're not that student. Now everybody is forced to want something. You well know that you're not good at that, but you're thinking about money. Like, you know, you want it. Man. When you go to school for the counseling, and you see you counseling at college, and counseling, remember now, you never want to hurt the client or the student's feeling. That's our job. We never want to hurt somebody's feeling. We never want to say the wrong words. Because we can get in trouble for it. So we watch the words that we say. But when somebody comes to us, I always kind of try to break it down to them. I tell them that this is hard, but in a way that they can understand. I don't tell them that you can't do that, but I will break it down to them. Like I will have them face it. So the way it kind of works is basically, they come out of high school, you know, they do their learning orientation at school. I remember the big thing is getting out of their parents' house. That's the big thing. Party, you know, fun, after party in life, American dream. Doctor, nice cars, lawyer, that's what but not everybody is. So they see counselor and I'm an advisor and the counselor basically when they meet with them, the counselor, they tell them, okay, I want to be a doctor. The counselor will not tell you you can't be a doctor. He can't tell you and they will never tell you. Okay. The only thing they will show you is the courses that you will need to take to be a doctor. They basically pull out a syllabus or some kind of thing saying, okay, so this is the requirement, this is the prereq, this is how it is, this is what you need to take while you're here, this is da 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 But the advisors, they're not going to go in detail each course, like each class, they're not going to basically say, this class is going to be this stuff, this class is going to be that type. They're not going to say that. You have to know yourself. You have to know what are you good at. And you go for a doctor, for example, let's say you want to be a doctor. You go for it. The doctor is not four years. It's eight plus years, plus volunteer. So like 10 to 15 years by the time you become a doctor after high school. So you have to know that. Are you willing to put that time into school, lawyers about the same amount of time. Are you willing to put that time into school? You have to ask yourself that. But if you don't ask those questions to yourself and you go want to be a doctor, you don't go in school. First you have to get your BA, then go to medical school. But while you BA, you want to take science classes, biology classes, you know, all these other mm -hmm. chemistry classes. But then, look at this stuff. You take chemistry class. Not many people, I'm gonna, not many people pay college out there token. Many people go college to financial aid or scholarships. And the scholarships for national aid, they require at least half 2.0. You know, all the scholarships usually are 3.0 and above scholarships. But financial aid is 2.0. But your program, like nursing and all this stuff, the steps to be adapted, is 3.0 and above. So you take a chemistry class, and you're not good at chemistry. You fail. You take biology class. You're not good at biology. You fail. You retake again. You don't do good again. So all this failing is going into your transcript, is hurting your transcript, your cumulative GPA. That's what it's hurting, it's hunting. So it's lowering your cumulative GPA to low, low. By the time you're realizing that's not you, you already messed up your GPA. So when you already messed up your GPA, it's hard to get yourself back up. And at that college, your GPA will follow you 
no matter even if you change major, let's say you realize after a year, after a year of uh, classes after classes, that it's, it's not you that you, it's not you being not smart or being dumb, it's not you, it's just you're not good at that. Not everybody good at something. Obama is a president. He might not good at something, like he might not know what I do. Like, he, if, if an example I'm using Obama, you might think he's the smartest person because he's a president, and all, but if you bring him on my job and you had him do, he's not going to be good. That's just real. Not everybody is good at everything. Everybody is expert on something. So if you're not good at biology, science, and all this other stuff, chemistry, it doesn't mean that you're dumb. It doesn't mean that you're not smart. It just means that that's not for you. That's, that's how it is. And you're not going to succeed. So you have to find something that you think you will succeed. So after a year, you realize that you're not going nowhere with this. Like, you know, you just basically failing, failing, failing. And you decided to change your major to maybe how science, maybe political, maybe criminal justice, you know, all other fields. The thing is that cumulative GPA, that while you are at that college, will follow you around. Whatever major you change to, it might not be the requirement of the major, but it will still be under your transcript. It will be there. So, so no matter how good whatever you do in the other, that will be there. Any classes that you took at that college will hunt you down to our lab. That GPA is a marked GPA. It's gonna carry around, carry around. Wherever you go, that low GPA, you could not get rid of it because if you fail like four to five classes, maybe if you just get 2.0, four to five classes in college, 2.0 is considered for C plus, or no, excuse me, C, 2.0. It's just normal C. Five classes, 2.0. And five classes four point oh. Your GPA is meeting at two point eight, somewhere there. That's where your GPA comes to. Two point eight, two point five. That's where your GPA is meeting. It's harder. It's harder to boost your GPA up than to lower your GPA down. It's easier to lower your GPA up. It's harder to boost your GPA up. So once you have 2.0 or 1 point something GPA, no matter how many 4.0s you gain throughout, it's going to be very, very hard. It's not like high school. High school is easy to bump your GPA up. College is not. You've got to know that once you go on a college, every class you take, you have to know that that's for you or you're going to fail majorly, and when you fail majorly, that GPS is carrying behind you. It's like a tattoo, an erasable tattoo. It's like something that's boom, hammered to you. Like that's part of you, but part of your life is going to carry you around. And it's going to be so hard to get it out. Now, remember, if you want to be a doctor, your GPS is so low, you get your PA, and some, you know, chemistry or biology, you want to go to medical school. The University of Washington, example, medical school, to enter GPA is minimum. Minimum meaning the very bad to even look at your application. That's minimum. To look at your application, 3.7. To just look at your application, like, like to just look at your application, not even 
meeting in the committee, talking about, discussing about can we accept him, before you even go to the discussion, for them to even look at your application, 3.7. And many of the schools are like that. So if you're not, if you messed up way back then, and 3.7 is considered as an honor, many, many majors, that's honor roll. You honor. Honors, you are an honor student, 3.7. But you don't. They see you as, ah, should we even look at his application? And, and other schools, they consider, they give you like president honor roll, vice president honor roll, dean honor roll, you know, like, oh, he's smarter. But here, they go and like, do we even need to look him? Like, what, what? What is this GPA? They go like that. They question 3.7. So that means in order to compete, you need 4 all, 3 9. <laughs> That's what you need. So if you're not getting that, and you have 3.5, 3.6, in college, I'm going to tell you, it's tough to even get 3.0 and above. Whoever is getting 3.0 and above, they put a heck of a study. I'm going to tell you that. Heck it. Of study, you don't get that overnight. So there is a lot of study that goes in. It's not easy college, young high schoolers who are going to graduate. It's not easy. You're gonna be going to face a very tough challenge. And your ability will be tested. You will be tested. Paper after paper. In example, you want to be taking three courses. Each course might have you write throughout the quarter. The quarter is three months. Each course might have you write like six paper, five paper. Let's just say five paper. Five times three, fifteen. And each paper, the lowest, let's just say five pages. Five pages is like, that's the baby, the lowest. Example, I'm just going to say five pages. When you have 15 papers to write, each five page, 15 times five now. That's where you come your mind. How many papers are you facing now? Like 55? If I'm right, yeah. If you have, like, in three months, 55 to 60 page of papers to write, and it's not the same. You can't do use it. That's the thing. Different topic. Three months, and that's the lowest. I'm just giving you the lowest estimate. Sometimes are 10 pages. That's the lowest that I'm giving you. At university standard, that's the lowest. Five pages is the lowest. This should be a baby for you. If, if you complain about writing a five-page paper, then take more time before you go to school, college. Take more time. That's what I would advise. If you have to write six pa 60 pages or so at a quarter, you're going to need a heck of a study. You're going to need a heck of a time. You're going to need to think. You want it to brainstorm. You don't just write papers again, remember. You have to write a good paper. A good paper gets a good grade. A bad paper gets a bad grade. So you have to have that in the back of your head. 60 page paper, each page will be critiqued by the professor so much deeply that you will think that this profession, that, does he not have a life to critique my paper like that? Professors will say, come on. Come on, if you miss somewhere, punctuation, everything. Each page, they will use the red pen on your paper. It's like you think, like, did they have a life like going through my paper like this? You wouldn't think that. You will assume that he will have so many papers that he will just wait. No. He will read your paper word by word. You have to know that word by word. And professors will know the way you speak. That's the way they assume that that's the way you write your papers. The way you speak. That's the way you write your papers. 
if your papers is speaking differently than you, red flag. They have a system, they have a website to catch plagiarism. So if your papers speaking differently than the way you speak, your time, they follow your time. When you're in class, when they say discussion time, professors, they don't mean discussion time, discussion time as in like we just discussed it, something topic. They are trying to hear your voice. They try to hear who you are. So when you write a paper, they know you. Like, okay, it's like Adam Machine, this is his paper. Okay, Adam speaks this way, this way, this way. But if your paper's not speaking that, they're gonna be like, Adam does not speak this way. No, he doesn't. Ta 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 on the computer. They'll find it. If you plagiarize, no, they will find it. They're smart. They got PhDs, academic, well, well, knowledge. So you can't, you can't try to go the easy way. There's no easy way in college. High school, you could cheat, you could plagiarize all the time. <laughs> High school yeah. teachers, they only need bachelors. And to get bachelors is basically like what you're going through. Like, you know, it's not, it's really nothing. But when you go beyond bachelors, that's when your talent, your ability will be tested to the limit. So you high schoolers, they have to know, they really have to know what they want to do. Like what they are good at. When you're high school, you will figure out what you're good at. If they're good at something, that will be good at. So they have to know. That's about my end. Knowing what they want to be and what they do. Why can we hit you up, Mr. Abdullah? Um, I am at the Green River um, Community College, a career navigator. And the state, I'm stationed at City Hall. If you um, do come at Green River, um, you, will, uh, you ask uh, the Welcome Center Workforce Education, that's my department, the Workforce Education, and um, you'll be able to easily um, find me. Um, also, my email, um, B as in boy, Abdallah at greenriver.edu. I'm going to spell it all out again. B as in boy, A as in apple, B as in boy, D as in dog. A as an apple, double L, A as an apple, apple, H as an horse, at Green River, that edu, as my email. Email me, contact me, I'll be um, most happy uh, to respond to any comments and questions that I'm um, giving as my app. Thank you, Adam.